I was listening to a programme on the radio a few weeks ago, I can't remember what it's called, but it was a, a series they do in which they, I think it's called something like Philosophy in the Pub, something like that. Anyway, it's, um, it's basically a, a magazine programme, talk programme, in which various experts discuss a number of issues in a social situation. Sounds like it's taking place in a bar. And there's usually a couple of items I think they'll talk about. And in this particular case, there was two topics from the discussion. The first was about Jaffa cakes, which are a type of cake or biscuit. And the second topic was about trans issues, the status of what it is to be trans, transgender specifically. And the first one was fascinating about Jaffa cakes. Because if you're not sure what a Jaffa cake is, a Jaffa cake is a kind of biscuit, or at least it's a kind of biscuit in the sense that you'll find it in a packet that looks like a biscuit, a biscuit packet. You'll find it in the supermarket on an aisle that's about biscuits. And you'll probably use it in the way that you would use a biscuit. You put a little plate next to a cup of tea. So it functions like a biscuit. But technically, it's actually a cake. By which I mean it's... Um, how do they describe it? You said, they said you can tell the difference between a cake and a biscuit. Just leave a cake and a biscuit out. The biscuit will go soft and the cake will go hard. But it's to do with the way that they're actually physically constructed. Technically a Jaffa cake is a cake. And the reason why this came to prominence a few years ago is that um, we have a tax here in the UK called Value Added Tax VAT, which uh, the manufacturers have to pay on their products and ultimately it's passed on to consumers. And uh, biscuits are subject to Value Added Tax. Cakes are not. So it's in the interests of the people who manufacture Jaffa cakes, McVitie's in this case, to have that product classified as a cake, not as a biscuit, because it means it's cheaper for them and ultimately cheaper for the consumer. And they, they actually went to court on this to demonstrate, to prove that this product, which to all intents and purposes seems like a biscuit, is actually a cake. And as part of that, they actually produced a large, like 12 inch diameter Jaffa cake and it's effectively a big sponge cake with a layer of orange jelly and chocolate topping. Just so this is what it looks like when it's big. We're just selling tiny cakes. So there, there was a really fascinating discussion. And it was proved that Jaffa cake, there isn't VAT on Jaffa cakes. They are classified as cakes. And what the discussion on this programme came to you about was about the different ways in which we go about classifying these things. Because there's a way of classifying them technically and this is the one that applied in the case of the Jaffa cake, you look at the physical properties of the object, say, so, oh, right, technically this is a cake. And, uh, but then the other way of doing it, which is the kind of social definition of cake, which is where it looks at, or the social definition of this object, which looks at its actual use and how people are regarding it, what people do with it. And to all intents and purposes, in that sense, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, it functions like a biscuit. People think of it like a biscuit. You find it in the biscuit aisle of the supermarket and so on. Uh, so there was a, quite a good discussion about that. And it came down to these different ways in which we define things. Do we define things according to some technical specification? Or do we define things according to their social function? How they're actually used? And under what circumstances might we want to privilege one over the other? Now when they finished talking about that topic they moved on to talking about trans issues. And there was no overt connection between these two subjects at all. They were very restrained in drawing parallels, which I thought was admirable. I think there was just one tiny reference made during this second part that perhaps arguments from the first could be ported over to the second. But as I said, they didn't make a big deal out of it. And, uh, and they had this uh, person on there, a trans woman on there, talking about her experience and some of the uh, policy around that, some of the philosophy, if you like, around that, some of the technical aspects of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. And although they didn't say so, some of the kind of social functioning of men and women, how men and women are perceived in society, how we designate individuals to one or other of those categories, or designate them outside of those categories if we're able to do so. But I thought that was really interesting distinctions to be made there between this reliance on the technical, as opposed to a reliance on the, the social. What do, how do we actually function? And there's other ways of doing it as well, but these, as I said, these are just the two ways of classifying that were brought out in that particular show.
Now I was thinking about that earlier on this morning because I watched this morning a, um, a debate, I suppose you'd call it, uh, on YouTube between two folk um, contrapoints, who's a YouTuber I, I've watched for years, and uh, another YouTuber, Blair White, who I'm not familiar with. Interesting. And it was about uh, trans issues. The uh, uh, Blair White is trans, as and um, ContraPoint identifies as genderqueer. And it, it, the whole conversation was about... Uh, well, it, 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 it kind of became a, um, a holding to account of various opinions and, uh, and, and uh, statements that uh, Blair White had said. But also, you know, some some uh, some commentary on those issues generally, and this idea of technical came up quite a bit in this. Blair White used the word technical quite a lot during this. Technically, this person is male because they were assigned male a male gender at birth, or because they had primary or secondary uh, sexual characteristics appropriate to one or other of the the traditional genders. Technical. I think she used that I maybe mean, four or five times, technically. And that's... There's a sense of truth in that. I mean, there's no... I guess. I mean, there's, there's always grey areas. These are fuzzy sets, aren't they? Uh, but... Uh, but ContraPoint, on the other hand, didn't... I didn't hear him use the word technical. But he seemed to be relying on a... a, a kind of use function. Use isn't the right word, but a such social... Um, understandings of what these categories are about, particularly as it relates to gender, but also to a certain extent as it relates to biological sex. Um, he described at one point biological sex as a, a kind of cluster of primary and secondary secondary characteristics, and there isn't a clear cut-off point, even within um, biology, between the genders we have to make kind of arbitrary distinctions at a certain point, even if the majority of people do fall relatively um, conveniently within one of the two ones that were prescribed. So, but as I said, Blair White seemed to be um, very conversant with and very attached to this technical definition, whereas ContraPoints was a more arguing for a social definition and perhaps other definitions as well. One of the things that came out in the comments afterwards, and did appear in the, uh, not comments, kind of questions, there were supposed to be questions, or actually comments, but did appear also in their conversation itself, it was about the status of language in all this. One of the uh, people who left a question or comment had said, oh, this is just a question of semantics. And my ears kind of pricked up at that point, because semantics is fascinating to me, and language is fascinating to me, because language is important. Um, Language, as uh, Stephen Pinker put it, is a window into human nature. It can reveal what's going on in our psyches and in our understandings and about how we go about constructing common sense, how we make sense of the world, which I think is really interesting. But uh, so to, to, to just say these are just this is just a semantic argument about the nature of definitions, I think misses the the underlying ideas which are powering those statements, which are powering the, the logic on either or both sides, and are forming the understandings that's taking place. So for example, and, and just, just to, to reinforce that, that the idea that language is, uh, is important comes out in, in, in uh, my own interests at least, in terms of an understanding of conceptual metaphor theory and uh, cognitive linguistics, cognitive poetics, those kind of understandings, which, you know, just to reiterate what Stephen Pinker says, is that, uh, you know, language, is a, to the extent it's a window into human nature, is revealing what kinds of processes are going on in our understanding, processes which are themselves highly metaphorical, highly analogical. We think in analogies, as Douglas uh, Hofstadter put it, we think in metaphors. There's people like George Lakoff and Mike Johnson have talked about endlessly. A lot of evidence to suggest that. And those metaphorical, linguistic, analogical thought processes, 
are revealed in the kinds of language we use, in the, the metaphors, the analogies, the similes, the synecdoches, the metonymies that we use in our speech. And that was happening, of course, like, like in all conversation, that was happening throughout this debate between ContraPoints and Blair White, sometimes overtly. So one or other of those participants would bring an analogy into the fray, rather like I just brought the analogy between Jaffa cakes and trans issues into it. Uh, so at one point Blair White was talking about an analogy with um, the Rachel Dolezal case, in which Rachel Dolezal, who is a white woman, presented herself as black and kind of wanted to be thought of as black. Uh, that's an analogy between gender and race. In one of the other comments, someone had mentioned um, the decision that a young person might make to uh, take puberty blockers, for example, as being analogous to allowing a young person to get a tattoo. That's an analogy. And whether we find that analogy compelling or not, whether we find it valid or not, it's going to depend on we are, and whether we ourselves are running those kinds of analogies subconsciously in our own thinking, if those same analogies are powering our own understanding. Sometimes those analogies and those metaphors aren't as overt as that. They don't take the form of, it's like this person doing that. They're more um, subtle. Might just come out in an individual use of words. So uh, words like uh, deformed and abnormal and cure were used quite a bit whether gender dysphoria could be cured, or whether trans, being transgender could be cured, whether it was an abnormality that needs to be fixed, whether it was a, um, uh, you know, a wrong that needs to be righted. I mean, that's dependent upon an understanding, perhaps non-consciously held understanding, which equates transgender status as being like a disease, like an illness. It's an analogy, it's not overtly stated perhaps, but it comes out in little bits of the language, like deformity. That there is some form which is ideal, perhaps um, guaranteed by some technical definition of what a man is, or technical definition of what a woman is. That's the form which is ideal, and anything which strays too far from that form is a deformation, an aberration, an abnormality. But to make, for that to make sense, you have to have that understanding going on. You have to have that idea that transgender is a disease. Another one of the uh, overt analogies that was mentioned, which I think ContraPoint mentioned, was the analogy with um, homosexuality and how homosexuality, which used to be considered a disease, an abnormality, a, a kind of deformed, deviant way of being, is no longer thought of as such. It's a variant. It's not a, a deviation from some technically defined norm uh, and that's that's using it as using an, an analogy a metaphor a set of understandings which reveal a very different way of thinking so I don't think it is just a question of semantics you know whether a, whether a Jaffa cake is a cake or a biscuit isn't semantic in the sense that is 20% VAT levied on the product if you think one thing and not if you think the other um, technically speaking. Seeing transgender as a disease or a, deform, a deformity, an aberration, an abnormality, or re referring to it in those terms, is semantic, but not if you, if there is a series of consequences to that, which might be to do in, with enforced cure, or might be to do with the, 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 the denial of treatment, or might be to do with the um, the trivialising of prejudice against certain folk, perhaps uh, by insurance companies, for example, uh, or the dismissal of certain people's opinions because they fall outside the, that technically described norm. So yeah, words matter, and it's not just about being politically correct. That's what's often how it's often phrased, as if this is just about political correctness, an example of virtue signalling, careful policing of one's own and other people's language, 
to ensure that, uh, that right thinking is maintained. But it isn't really about that in my view. It's about understanding what it is you're thinking. Understanding what your thinking is doing in the world. Understanding what your what the, the structure of your understanding of the world is and how you're conveying that to other people and sharing these underlying metaphors, underlying analogies with other people. So yeah, Jaffa Cake Theory. Of, um, of gender diversity. Beautiful day here at Toronto. Look at that. That's my dog.